Good morning. Thank you so much, Barb and Diane and everybody who sang. And welcome to worship with Grace Congregational United Church of Christ. It called Worship is based on Psalm 105, and it's printed responsibly in our responsibly in our bulletin. We are busy people. Lots to do and miles to go before we see. Our full lives are made better by coming together to worship God. God who has given us life in all its fullness is worthy of our Sabbath, worthy of our attention, our thanks and praise. Let us worship God in the splendor of this sanctuary, in the warmth and love of this faith community. As we turn to, in the black hymnal, uh, number 35, and sing, O Mighty God, when I pray in wonder, a little explanation of the translation might be helpful. This song is uh, How Great Thou Art, uh, which was one of my dad's favorite hymns of all time, and so I know it somewhat well. And this is, if you read these little notes in the, um, in the hymnal, sometimes it's very helpful. I don't want to read this entire note except to say that this translation and arrangement were created for the New Century Hymnal to restore what they consider to be the original meaning and flavor of the original author's uh, poetry in the very beginning. So the words are a little bit different than you might be used to, and yet this goes back to the original poem. Let us pray. Good morning, God of this new day. We gather for worship asking for your blessing on this hour. May we, by your Holy Spirit, sing praises, hear your word, offer heartfelt prayers, and invite you again into our lives. You have given us the name of Christian and the name of grace. We lift up your name in these moments. May our worship spill out of this hour to be at the center of our lives, drawing us always and ever closer to you God of incarnation and relationship. Amen. Our prayer of confession is based on Psalm 51, several verses from that psalm, and our prayer is printed in unison in the bulletin. Let us pray. Holy God, we try to keep you close to us, but in the process we push our neighbors away. We have been distracted in a distracting world and withheld love from each other and from you. Have mercy on us, O God. In your compassion, cleanse and release us from our sin. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew the right spirit in us. Amen. Who is to condemn? It is Christ who died and who is raised, who is at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. The peace of the risen Christ is with you. Let us stand and share signs of that peace with one another. And now it's time for Grace Bible Story Theater. So if you're young or if you're feeling young and you want to come up and help us act out a Bible story, come on up. <clears throat> Here's our, one of our props. All right, we'll put this, we'll put this here. <clears throat> Can anybody see this? This is a ladder. It's supposed to be a, I mean, I suppose we could set it up. This is a, this is Jacob's ladder. Yeah, Jacob moved us his ladder. And uh, we are going to need some, some thespians, some actors. Hi, Greta. How are you? I love your bows today. How are you doing? I hope you're having a good day. 
All right. Um, well, you already have bows and I don't want to mess them up, but um, I wonder, you might want to put this on um, if you want to be Jacob. You don't have to. You could even just put it on your shoulder or something. I'm going to give you this. This is going to be a rock. Okay. And I'm going to read a story. Will, will you help me tell this story? Or would you rather a grown up did? You could bring a grown up with you if you want. That's always possible. Let's see what we got. We'll read the story and we'll see what we can do to act out this story, okay? Okay, all right, that's fine. Uh, let's, see where, let's see where we start. Um, we're gonna tell a story about a guy named Jacob. And Jacob went on a journey, okay? So he was walking. Would you like to walk with me like you're Jacob? Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and he stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, that could be the stone, and you could take that stone, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. If you want to lie down, you can. If you want to pretend to do this, you don't have to. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reaching to heaven. So this ladder that Jacob saw in his dream went all the way up in the sky and went to heaven. And the angels of God, can you imagine this, were going up and down on it. So some were going up and some were coming down and then maybe they were going back in a circle. I don't know, but he had this amazing dream and it went all the way up into heaven. And the Lord stood beside him and said, so God came and spoke to Jacob and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west and the east and the north and the south, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Can you imagine hearing that in a dream? Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke up from his sleep. Oh, there's Jacob. And said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning and he took the stone that he had put under his head. Want to grab the stone? And set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. I'm not going to pour oil on it, but we can pretend. And he called that place Bethel, which means the house of God or God's house. There are so many wonderful, fabulous stories in the Bible and, you know, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And sometimes it can be a lot of fun to read them and hear them and tell them and even act them out. So I appreciate your help. And thank you so much to your grown-up for helping out as well. And uh, let's take a minute and say a prayer, all right? So I'm going to bow my head and close my eyes and talk to God and say thank you so much for Greta and for Justine and for children and youth, and for Sunday school. Thank you that um, you're teaching us the stories and what they mean and even what they mean in our lives. Lord, watch over us, protect us, and lead us forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. Good morning. I'm in for Diane today. She is ill. Today's scripture, Psalm 145 verses 8 through 9 and 14 through 21. The Lord is merciful and compassionate, very patient and full of faithful love. The Lord is good to everyone and everything. God's compassion extends to all his handiwork.
14 through 21. The Lord supports all who fall down, straightens up and all who are bent low. All eyes look to you, hoping, and you give them their food right on time, opening your hand and satisfying the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, faithful in all his deeds. The Lord is close to everyone who calls out to him, to all who call out to him sincerely. God shows favor to those who honor him, listening to their cries for help and saving them. The Lord protects all who love him, but he destroys every wicked person. My mouth will pro proclaim the Lord's praise and every living thing will bless God's holy name forever and ever. And the second reading is in Genesis 32, 22 through 31. This is where Jacob wrestles with God. Jacob got up during the night, took his two wives, his two women servants, and his 11 sons, and crossed the Jabbok River's shallow water. He took them and everything that belonged to him. He helped them cross the river. But Jacob stayed apart from himself, and a man wrestled with him until dawn broke. When the man saw that he couldn't defeat Jacob, he grabbed Jacob's thigh and tore a muscle in Jacob's thigh as he wrestled with him. The man said, let me go because the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I won't let you go until you bless me. He said to Jacob, what's your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name won't be Jacob any longer, but Israel, because you struggled with God and with men and one. Jacob also asked and said, tell me your name. But he said, why do you ask for my name? And he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Peniel, because I've seen God face to face and my life has been saved. The sun rose as Jacob passed Peniel, limping because of his thigh. Here in today's reading, I hope we use it to our understanding and blessing. These stories from the Hebrew Scriptures, now this is what we said we were going to do in August, was pull some of these out. These stories are amazing. There should be Emmys and Oscars given out for Old Testament best picture, best screenplay, most dramatic musical score, best drama. This story of Jacob rolling around all night for a new name would get nominations, right? Even just the lighting must have been very tricky. Now, it might help to remember where Jacob fits in the chronology, okay, to locate him in the context of the story of ancient Israel as it's already rolling along here. We are reading in Genesis, which of course starts with, in the beginning, God. But we want to fast forward a little bit from there. And as we do, by chapter 12 of Genesis, we get to Abram. You remember Abram, God makes a covenant with Abram and Sarai, who become Abraham and Sarah, and God promises to make them into a vast nation. And because of their age, it is a miracle that they then have Isaac. Isaac grows up and marries Rebekah. Now we've come all the way to Genesis 25. Genesis 25, 20 through 26. Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, and the sister of Laban, the Aramean, from Pananaram. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife, since she was unable to have children. The Lord was moved by his prayer, and his wife, Rebekah, became pregnant. But the boys pushed against each other inside of her, and, as, and she said, if this is what it's like, why did it happen to me? So she went to ask the Lord, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two different peoples will emerge from your body. One people will be stronger than the other. The older will serve the younger. Very unusual in those days. When she reached the end of her pregnancy, she discovered that she had twins. The first came out red all over, clothed with hair, and she named him Esau. Immediately afterward, his brother came out gripping Esau's heel, and she named him Jacob. 
Isaac was 60 years old when they were born. Jacob came out grabbing onto the guy ahead of him, his brother Esau. Kind of sets the tone for the life of Jacob. And you remember that Esau was the one who sold his birthright, which was a huge deal in those days. Jacob kind of swindled it out of Esau for some lentil stew, a little bit of duress there because Esau was very hungry. And Jacob saw his chance to get ahead. See, Jacob was like uh, J.R. Ewing and Logan Roy and the guys from Suits and Han Solo all mashed in together. Shrewd, crude, a little bit of attitude, you know? Later, Jacob used deception again to get his father, Isaac, to bless him instead of Esau. So he was pretty crafty all the way through. So by Genesis 27, Esau was furious at Jacob because his father had blessed him, and Esau said to himself, When the period of mourning for the death of my father is over, I will kill my brother. Rebekah was told what her older son Esau was planning, so she summoned her younger son Jacob and said to him, Esau, your brother is planning revenge. He plans to kill you. So now, my son, listen to me. Get up and escape to my brother Laban in Haran. Live with him for a short while until your brother's rage subsides, until your brother's anger at you goes away and he forgets what you did to him. You would watch this show, wouldn't you? <laughs> and out there on the run, okay, Jacob has all kinds of adventures and he has a dream one night about a raised staircase up to the sky and he sees angels going up and coming down on it. God stands at the top of it and tells Jacob, your descendants will become like the dust of the earth and I will protect you. Then Jacob meets his mother's family and he marries Leah and Rachel, has kids, gets very, very rich with questionable techniques. So then he gets scared of his boss Laban who is Leah and Rachel's father, and who's not too happy with Jacob. And Jacob takes his family and takes off with the whole vast group of wives and kids and animals and possessions to go back to where he grew up. Are you following this? Laban comes after him, but they work it out. Jacob sees more angels, okay, while he's making his way back, and then Jacob realizes that he's going to have to see his brother Esau if he's going to go back to where he grew up, the guy who once wanted to kill him. So Jacob sends a message to Esau, Genesis 32 in the Common English Bible. He gave them these orders, say this to my master Esau, this is the message of your servant Jacob, I lived as an immigrant with Laban. Where I've stayed till now. I own cattle, donkeys, flocks, men servants, and women servants. I'm sending this message to my master Esau now to ask that he be kind. The messengers returned to Jacob and said, We went out to your brother Esau, and he's coming to meet you with 400 men. Jacob was terrified and felt trapped, so he divided the people with him and the flocks, cattle, camels into two camps. He thought, if Esau meets the first camp and attacks it, at least one camp will be left to escape. And then Jacob prays, God help us. I mean, anybody think this Old Testament stuff is boring? A lot of screaming going on here. So. Now we've arrived at our delicious Hebrew scripture story for this morning, Genesis 32, 22 through 31. Jacob got up during the night, took his two wives, his two women servants, and his 11 sons, and crossed the Jabbok River's shallow water. Jabbok River is a wordplay on the name of Jacob. He took them and everything that belonged to him, and he helped them cross the river. But Jacob stayed apart by himself, and a man wrestled with him until dawn broke. When the man saw that he couldn't defeat Jacob, he grabbed Jacob's thigh and tore a muscle in Jacob's thigh as he wrestled with him. The man said, let me go because the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I won't let you go until you bless me. He said to Jacob, what's your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name won't be Jacob any longer, but Israel, because you struggled with God and with men and won. Jacob also asked and said, tell me your name. But he said, why do you ask my name? And he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Denial because I've seen God face to face and my life has been saved. The sun rose as Jacob passed through a limping 
because of his thigh. This is a weird story, ladies and gentlemen. Beautiful, weird, strange story. And there are so many different things going on, and there are so many different meanings that have been read into and back out of it. Can we just take one piece for this morning? It says, a man wrestled with him until daybreak. But of course, the man tells Jacob he has struggled with God. And Jacob realizes he's seen God face to face and lived. And so we are to understand that Jacob has grappled with the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel. Very strange story. And you can find volumes of christian -y interpretations. Nice little churchy sermons on this Hebrew scripture. But just start by noticing the first thing, which would seem to be that it is okay to wrestle with God. It's in the Bible. It's okay to struggle with our faith. And you can take it directly to God's face. In fact, if you read the text, the text suggests that God brings the struggle to Jacob. This may be uncomfortable for some people, but the biblical record is full of knockdown, drag out struggle with God. Some of the Psalms are outright screams. Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you left me alone? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my anguished groans? Again, it must be okay to yell at God. It's in the prayer book. And the life of so many saints and servants reveals deep heart-rending turbulence. Time Magazine in 2016 had this article. During her lifetime, Mother Teresa was often referred to as a living saint, winning the 1979 Nobel Peace Prize for her work with the missionaries of charity, helping poor and sick people. However, Mother Teresa's seemingly unbreakable bond with God was much more complicated than she let on in public. Letters made public years after her death in 1997 revealed that Mother Teresa spent nearly half a century without feeling God's presence, neither in her heart, she said, nor in the Eucharist. That absence seems to have started at almost precisely the time she began tending the poor and dying in Calcutta, and except for a five-week break in 1959, never abated. Although perpetually cheery in public, the Teresa of the letters lived in a state of deep and abiding spiritual pain. In more than 40 communications, many of which have never before been published, she bemoans the dryness, darkness, loneliness, and torture she is undergoing. She compares the experience to hell, and at one point says it has driven her to doubt the existence of heaven and even of God. Her letters reveal she wrestled with the existence of God. In an undated prayer to Jesus, she said she had no faith. Such a lengthy crisis of faith becomes all the more significant when we know that Mother Teresa has been declared an official saint of the Catholic Church. I never read a saint's life where the saint has such an intense spiritual darkness, Reverend James Martin, author of My Life with the Saints, told Time. No one knew she was that tormented. The revealing letters were published in a book entitled Mother Teresa, Come Be My Light, compiled and edited by Reverend Brian Karadacek. She was suffering that loneliness, that sense of being unloved, unwanted, in her relationship with Jesus, Reverend Karadacek said. But in solidarity with, and she identified with, others who were in some way living that sense of loneliness and being unloved. I mean, we grew up the stories of Mother Teresa, right? And a good part of the world points to Mother Teresa as a definition of being fully alive with God in service to humanity. But it apparently was not unicorns and cotton candy. It is biblical to fully engage in struggle with God for a viable faith and practice. 
You notice that God will not shatter under pressure. God is not a fragile flower. Also, and it's important to note in many religious circles and in some political circles, that God is not a narcissist. God is not waiting to burn me up if I say the wrong thing in my give and take with God. When the living God comes for you in the middle of the night as you're standing next to your river Jabbok, you don't have to be polite. You can be real. You can grab on. It is worth a soul struggle that knocks over some internal furniture to figure out who God is for you and what the universe wants from you and for you. Jacob and many others who have gone ahead of us would say that the blessing at daybreak is worth rolling around in the mud at night. Another thing to notice is how intimate wrestling is. Look at your cover in your bulletin. Look at this picture of this painting. Kind of small, but if you, if you can look and see what's going on there. The life of faith is game on. It's hands on. Loving God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength is a whole body headlong dive into a lifelong dirt level engagement with Yahweh. When you've cursed and thrown things and spit blood at God, there is a fullness and a texture and there's guts to your love. It is not just being nice. It's not just pretend. If all we do is smile and nod, Life will eventually tackle us. Not just to beat us up, not just to be harmful to us, but the depth of blessing comes out of the struggle. The blessing of our identity in God doesn't come to us on the outskirts of the difficulty at some safe, comfortable distance. Wrestling is serious business. You can get hurt. Jacob gets up with a limp. And the truth is that we will not be unscathed in life. Even playing nice and sipping our church tea, if you will, life is still going to hurt sometimes. How much better then to know that you have been real and fully present and authentic in the struggle of faith. So that every time you limp past that place, you know the blessing and the hurt. And you know that they are both part of the same intimate, hands-on, in your face, back and forth, headlock with the Holy One. Okay. These stories are origin stories. Search your feelings, Luke. You know this to be true. This stuff is meant to be foundational for the people of God. Jacob's name, by the blessing of God, is going to be the one who struggles with God and humans and is given victory. That's what this passage says Israel actually means. Not just the person Jacob Israel, but the nation Israel. So this is at the beginning of it all. This is at the base of all of it, of all that is to come. The patriarchs, the blessing, the covenant, the kingdom, the Messiah. When Jesus spoke and was telling his stories, People in the crowd would have known these earlier origin stories. They were building blocks of an oral faith culture, of course. Just as for a long time in American history, everyone who'd been to school knew Shakespeare and could converse in those plots and themes and characters. The founders of our country, remember, wrote back and forth quoting Greek mythology. They all knew in depth the stories and ideas and the meanings of those tales. And they became building blocks of our culture and civilization, these ancient stories. To 
pull out these Old Testament stories and hold them up to the light and see how they shine and reflect and refract. It's very worthwhile for those who want to build our lives with biblical stuff. We are continuing to build a faith and a culture and civilizations on these building block ideas from these ancient stories. So we remember with this one that built into the whole thing is the struggle and the blessing. The wrestling makes for a way more interesting faith and life than one where the furniture is always straight and we always hold our teacup just so and we never have a limp. If the angel of God comes to you in your lonely night, you might want to grab on and get your shoulder low and go to the ground hard. Amen. In the New Century Hymnal, number 500 is We Are Climbing Jacob's Ladder. that have been heaped upon us. Would you encourage us to stand strong, to seek the blessings that you have provided for us, to recognize the many ways that you are with us, giving us strength and courage. Be with us again, precious Lord. Guide our lives as we bring our prayers before you for those near and dear to us, seeking healing and hope for them. Let us also remember those same mercies are lavished upon us, not because we deserve them, but because of your great and generous love for us. Help us receive these blessings and in turn be a blessing to someone else. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And we pray as Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Go with God's special blessing, knowing that it is ours to receive, to ingest, to enjoy, to tend, to grow, and to share. May God's Holy Spirit give us strength and guidance to be the blessing for which the world so hungers.
today and always. Amen.